Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, recently back from Vancouver, where I did another event with Richard Dawkins and Matt Dillahunty. And it was great to meet so many of you after the event. Those are um, surprisingly gratifying encounters, I must say. And I am always astonished to hear about the people who have traveled vast distances to get there. People came from Europe. People drove 18 hours. They're just amazing. Anyway, great to meet so many of you. And uh, I have more events coming up. San Francisco is technically sold out, although it feels like a few tickets have been liberated by Live Nation and a few of you have got them in the meantime. But basically sold out, although you can keep trying. I mean, literally, there might be five more tickets or something that will appear at some point. And Seattle's getting there. And those are my two events in December. January, I'm in Boston, D.C., New York, and Philadelphia. New York is not part of the live podcast tour. That's an event I'm doing with Lawrence Krauss and Matt Dillahunty. And that has been sold out for quite some time. That was that hit the calendar many months ago. The other events still have tickets available. And the guests have been lined up. And I'm looking forward to those. And there will be more dates hitting the calendar. So if you're interested in live events, the best way to hear about them is not to wait for my next podcast, where I make noises like these, but get on my email list on my website. You can also check the events page at samharris.org forward slash events. Once again, supporters of the podcast get early access to tickets, at least a week, but uh, in certain cases, it'll be longer than that. This is one of the few things I can do to give back to those of you who are supporting the podcast, which, as always, is much appreciated. And I've picked a venue for the Waking Up Book Club event I'm doing with Steven Pinker in March of next year. And we'll announce that soon, but it is a great venue, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. Also, to those of you who find it difficult to listen to podcasts, I don't know if any of you are listening now, but I hear from many people who just haven't figured out how to listen to podcasts. These people don't have commutes, they don't work out, they don't like earbuds, I don't know what the problem is, but they don't listen to podcasts and they're waiting for transcripts of these conversations. There are a few transcripts that I've published on my blog, but it's actually very time-consuming to produce transcripts because I, I, I will not let a raw transcript see the light of day. That Those are just indistinguishable from bad writing, no matter how well someone speaks. And it really does take a lot of time to edit the transcript, copy edit it, and refine it in a way that add some value. But I've decided to take the time to do that and release the best of these conversations as a book. Uh, the working title there is Experiments in Conversation. What I'll be doing there is I, I will actually go out to the people who I include in the book and give them a chance to refine their side of the conversation. This really will be an instance where the, the final word on many of these topics gets had in writing. So if you're interested in many of the exchanges I've had here, I'm determined to make these conversations in written form worth reading, even if you've heard the audio on which the text is based, because there'll be further questions that I ask of my guests, and we will have taken the time to sharpen up the original exchange and ensure that we say exactly what we mean in every case. So for those of you who don't like the sound of my voice, I will get you the text version of many of these conversations eventually. But for today's conversation, I am speaking with Kurt Anderson. Kurt is a best-selling author, and he's written for Vanity Fair and the New York Times. He's also written for Time and the New Yorker. He also writes for television and film and stage. He co-founded Spy Magazine. And he was at one point the editor-in-chief of New York Magazine. And he's the host and creator of Studio 360, the award-winning public radio show. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard College, where he was the editor of the Harvard Lampoon. But most relevant for today's conversation, he's the author of a new book titled Fantasyland, 
how America went haywire. Uh, and we talk about it today. We talk about the American aptitude for unfounded belief. We talk about the way in which credulity inspired the founding of America, specifically the religious lunacy of the Puritans. We talk about media and the growing populist mistrust of authority, the link between postmodernism and religious fundamentalism. And inevitably, this all comes around to the Trump phenomenon, about which Kurt has much to say, also the effect of fame on politics, uh, and there are other topics here. Anyway, we only had about an hour to discuss these things, so this is briefer than most podcasts, but I think you'll find Kurt's take on the present moment quite interesting. And now I bring you Kurt Anderson. I am here with Kurt Anderson. Kurt, thanks for coming on the podcast. My complete pleasure. So uh, I don't think we've ever met. I noticed that we've been to similar places like the Aspen Ideas Festival and places like that, but I'm not aware of having met. Am I, am I right about that? I think you're right about that. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you virtually. Now, you have written a fascinating book, which I think will be the more or less the totality of our conversation. The book is Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire, A 500-Year History. And like a few people I've had on the podcast recently, you seem to have written a book that was just perfectly poised to capture what was about to happen. Obviously, you had to have been writing this long before thoughts about a President <laughs> Trump were anything other than a punchline. Uh, and yet you have written really the, the backstory to our current moment in a way that is pretty remarkable. So congratulations on having such good luck as an author. Thank you. If I, if I believed in Providence, I would, I would figure I'd, I'd had it come my way. You know, absolutely. I, I started uh, working on this book, started thinking about this book many years ago, and then started uh, working on it 2013, 2014. And it was near the end, uh, the, the appearance of Donald Trump as the impending nominee, just as I was finishing the book, uh, yes, seemed like, I guess, lucky timing is the phrase. Yeah. Well, if you were a man given to prayer, you might have been praying for the wrong thing at that point. Well, yes, indeed. And I, I remember one, one, uh, early last year, waking up one morning when uh, Donald Trump seemed to be about to wrapping, if not wrapping up the nomination, it, him being a, a, a plausible winner at that point and saying to my wife, well, I know this is horrible to say, but if he gets the nomination, it could be very good for this book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, it, it really is amazing to read through the lens of our current moment. I would argue it, w it would have been a very different, this is something I said to Ken Burns when he was on, we were talking about his Vietnam documentary, which is this incredible time capsule experience of just looking at the divisiveness of, of American politics, in addition to the chaos of that war. And watching it through the lens of the present was very different than it would have been watching through let's say, the, the first term of Obama's presidency. Uh -huh. And that's it's also true with your book. I mean, obviously, there was many of the trends you talk about of American unreason, which we'll discuss, were present even there. But it's just, we really are at some kind of apotheosis of your thesis. No, it, uh, that's exactly correct. And, and as I've said to people, as I've been talking about the book since it came out, everything I am arguing here, and certainly the history that I'm laying out and arguing here, would have been true. We still would have been in a pickle by my lights had Donald Trump not been elected president. But here he is, and 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 a kind of poster boy, exhibit A, for for my history and for my theses, and and makes it a lot easier to explain what I'm talking about to people. Frankly, well, so before we jump into the book, just give us a brief, potted history of your intellectual life. You've been a novelist and a broadcaster and a magazine editor. How do you describe what you've been up to? Well, I, because I've done a lot of things, and I still do a couple of things, I, I usually go with what's on my passport, which is writer. But yeah, I, I uh, was a journalist, and then I became a magazine editor. I, I edited New York Magazine, started Spy Magazine back in the 80s, and then uh, began writing novels uh, at the end of the last century. And uh, about the time, I also started doing a radio show on public radio, which I which I still do. And I, so I still write novels and I still do the public radio show. And Fantasyland is is my first big nonfiction book. So that's that's basically the 
the sum of it. How often do you do your radio show? It's a weekly uh, show. It's a weekly hour called Studio 360. Right, right. Okay, so the book is essentially a history of American credulity. And I'm sure we will emphasize the downside of this, but there is, as you point out, more than the downside. There is some silver lining to this American disposition to unite what on their face seems like very different trends, but they all sort of push in the direction of believing things strongly on insufficient evidence. We have, you know, religious commitments and crack pottery and entrepreneurialism and a capacity for self-reinvention and a love of show business and celebrity culture and even conspiracy thinking. And all of these forces have brought us to this present moment. But before we dive into the negative aspects of all of this, can you say something about the silver lining for this American aptitude for unfounded belief? Well, uh, uh, unfounded or less than perfectly founded. I mean, th th there are benign aspects to this, certainly. And and there is even heroism. I, I can come to this place and I can build this thing or become this person or do this extraordinary thing, even though it's doubtful that you, the individual, will succeed in doing any of those things. But that sense of you know, the impossible dream, that has all of its obvious good sides and, and has served us well as a country in, in many different respects. So I would say that's it. I, I would say certainly the, 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 the freedom in, <laughs> until the freedom became, went too far uh, in, in, in believing crackpotism and, and disbelieving evidence or, or choosing not to believe evidence, all, all of those ways in which America indulged every flavor of belief true, false, crackpotish, brilliant, w was good w when it, in until it wasn't, until, until it became uh, a kind of uncontrollable kettle boiling over. So I, I would say the, the, the um, creating this extraordinary country out of nothing, uh, authoring this country from scratch, had many good sides. We could then get into all of the doubts about Oh, but you say this is good because they moved west because they believed it and they committed genocide against the Indians. Uh, and that's a different case. But I would say, by and large, much of what I see as becoming highly problematic and leading us to the place we've arrived at today was a net plus for most of our history. Let's start with the history because this is a work of history you've written and the roots of America, which really are seemingly in the DNA, I mean, literally in the DNA of the country, insofar as there was a kind of a selection pressure for a certain type of person to come here. There are two aspects to it, and, and that seem to be intertwined very early around the founding, which was on one level, you had people driven essentially by the myth of El Dorado, I mean, the mythical city of gold. And then you had others who were driven by the myth of the Garden of Eden, you know, literally wanting to find it on earth. And so there was this twin motive of a kind of get-rich-quick scheme and a pilgrimage that attracted more than its fair share of religious maniacs. And it's these two groups, and they came in waves from England, as you point out, and with vast numbers of them dying for the privilege of searching for one of these two things. And the people who were left, the people who made it, were really of this sort, the people who would take inordinate risk based on having been successfully advertised to, essentially a, a full advertising campaign for decades in England that proffered both of these fantasies to would-be colonists, and the people who were taken in were the founders of this country. Well, that's, you've put it exactly right. Uh, that's a beautiful summary. and and. As a certainly as a child, and even through high school, the history of those first European settlers that I knew were the were the were the Puritans in New England, and I and I was taught very little about the nature of their of their Protestantism, and the fact that it was for its time in the early 1600s perceived among the, the Church of England people back in England as a primitive medieval form of their newish religion of Protestantism. So I, I learned very little about the gold hunters down south, but as you say, that they they especially died by the hundred and kept coming and dying and not finding gold. It took them more than a generation to be convinced that there was no gold to be had uh, in in Virginia. So th those did seem like I mean not just kind of 
metaphorical nodes for our beginning, but the very real thing of, as you say, these, these two different forms of, of wishful, passionate belief in the either unprovable or untrue were, were, were our founders. And I, and I really didn't know about, as you say, this essentially first global advertising campaign put on by the, 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 the businessmen whose colonies these were, who, who had the charter from the Royal Charter from, the, from England to do some business here, build an empire. And, and so, yes, pamphlets, posters, and all kinds of advertising were, were put out uh, in, in England to convince these people to come here. And, and, uh, and as you say, it's not just, a, uh, it's not just a, a crack to say, and they self-selected for suckers. That is uh, uh, something historians before, uh, legitimate historians, real historians, PhD historians before me ha- have, have proffered as, as an important defining quality of of the early americans yeah i think you have a daniel borstein quote to that effect exactly that it was just a explicit selection pressure for those susceptible to to advertising so let's say something about the religious commitments of the puritans you know we have this word puritanism which does signify kind of a, an overweening attachment to biblical literalism and and a fondness for something like theocracy but People, I think, are not so in touch with the character of, of these founders. And, and in fact, you, you point out one moment where our confusion or revisionism is fairly surprising, that John Winthrop, the, the Puritan leader, is the author of this famous line about America being a city upon a hill. And when that phrase is invoked today, it really it means that essentially we're, we're an example to the whole world of what happens when a diverse society really gets its act together. It's like, this is just the, the summation of almost enlightenment values, you know, succeeding and, and some kind of, you know, moral order. But in the context in which he uttered these words, he was really talking about the fulfillment of end times prophecy. He was talking about Christ's imminent return to judge the living and the dead. And these were people who felt that was going to happen very soon. Uh, absolutely. And that this could be the New Jerusalem um, where where that happens, and and they thought of themselves as yes analogous to the biblical Israelites uh, searching for the promised land, but but not merely analogously. They literally thought this was going to happen, and that the new world could be um, the the epicenter of all that. The other thing about Puritans when we when we talk about them today, or the, use that word today, of course, it sim- it almost exclusively. Is a synonym for for prudishness and 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 sexual restraint, and of course, yes, that that was part of it, but not the most important or frankly interesting part of what the Puritans and especially the Puritans who came to America were all about. And and I say the Puritans who came to America because there were plenty of Puritans in in England and and on in continental Europe, but the ones who came here were these were this most zealous faction of a zealous faction of Puritans who were the the zealous faction of Protestants. So yes, they 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 absolutely believed in this in the end times coming very soon, and 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 that they were the agents, God's agents, uh, in coming to the new world to to see that through, as well as uh, being great believers in signs and wonders and symbols and and uh, regarding oddly shaped roots and meteor showers as various signs that they were either on the right track or that God was displeased, depending on the day. Mm, Well, I'm a little torn about how to proceed in this conversation, because on one level, it it would make sense to move through chronologically, you know, almost decade by decade, and get your take on how we got here. But another path would be to focus on specific variables like religion or conspiracy thinking or postmodernism and talk about how these things Interrelate. I, do you have an intuition about the, the the best way forward here? Well, I, I mean, I, I I thought the best way forward was to, for writing the book was to do it more or less chronologically. But doing it in those thematic ways, I'm entirely happy to do that. That is that's that's the other way to do it. So um, I'm happy to do that. I, I do want to mention just a, a character 
among the Puritans who we barely know today, I've, most people don't know of her, Anne Hutchinson, who was this extraordinary character. I just think she's a great story. So before we leave the Puritans altogether, I would love to talk a little about her because I find her so fascinating. Yeah, let's talk about Anne. She was a, a middle-aged mother of many, many children, well-to-do, came here in the early first waves of Puritans, settled in Boston, as they did, and um, lived in the, in the good part of town, neighbor of the governor, but decided very early on that she, uh, she, she, was, uh, she felt herself essentially sainted and in touch with the divine in a way that the, uh, all the, the male clergy and, and leaders were not. And began having essentially rump church sessions at her home that her husband allowed her to do, I guess. And, and they became very popular. And, and in addition to critiquing the sermons that were being given by the, of course, male Puritan leaders every Sunday, she, had, she brought a whole other piece to the, to, to the idea, to the Puritan Protestant Christian idea, which is that I can I can feel who's godly. I know who the elect are. Uh, I know who is who is with God and who isn't in this sixth sense way. And that because I feel it, it is true. Which when when we look at that in you know almost four hundred years retrospect, it's it's so she is to me a kind of prototypical American in that sense. And and of course they banished her and. And uh, threw her out, and she went and found her version of religious freedom down in Providence with Roger Williams. But her her case is presented today correctly, in so far as it goes, as this as this uh, with her as a uh, beleaguered feminist heroine, which she was judged by all these these guys, and being deprived of her religious freedom, as was also true. But she was she essentially one upped the the Puritan religious leaders in terms of their by my lights, uh, religious fever and, and extravagance. And, and again, did this other thing, which is, no, 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 I, I, am, I, am, uh, I am holy. I am a prophet. I feel these things, which, which uh, was not part of the, the Puritan idea. So I, I just find her an extraordinary character. And, and in, in, a way, in a way that the Puritans, even though much of their theology is become current again in American Protestantism. I find her as this extraordinary way ahead of her time figure in, in representing a kind of religious practice and belief that came to define American Protestantism almost uniquely in, in Christendom. Yeah, well, she was a kind of religious entrepreneur and, and others obviously have followed, but she also did expose the way in which any religious cult, no matter how fanatical, is always vulnerable to the even greater yes. fanaticism of one of its it, it, members. Ex yes, exactly. And and that that has been the story of of American Protestantism of being this very fissile thing with with no center, no no state church and and that as as they grow as as the new denominations emerge and they're all full of vigor and zeal and 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 fanaticism and then they cool down and and new Hot, more fanatical and zealous sects grow up, and no, that that is in a, in, a, in a nutshell the history of American Protestantism. And you actually touch on some of the older history of Protestantism, which is relevant here because it was clearly enabled by the birth of the printing press. I mean, so the, so the power of the media really is coincident. I mean, the emergence of the media as a powerful force to shape public opinion is coincident with the Protestant Reformation, and both are coincident with this populist trend that led to the widespread disparagement of experts. In the case of the Protestants, they were explicitly repudiating the expertise of the church, but you know, this is something that just continues to this day, where you have access to media allowing for, both on the, on the right and the left, a kind of kindling of doubt with respect to the established powers or established authorities. And it's a war that just rages generation after generation, where you just have these kind of waves of repudiation of, you know, what is, at least in, in the current generation's mind, you know, the considered opinions of those best informed on a given topic. But 
you know, the, the media is always allowing for a kind of sea change or an attempted sea change against that opinion, rather often on the parts of people who are just reinventing reality for themselves. A lot of this conversation is unconstrained by anything that has gone before. Exactly right. And indeed, I, 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 who knows? We'll, we'll, we'll know, our descendants will know better in some hundreds of years if the digital revolution and the internet is as disruptive in the way that the movable type and the printing press in the late 15th century was. I have a feeling it will be and is, and, and certainly as you're suggesting, it is, it is this extraordinary, in the case of America especially, bookending of, of this technology in the case of the printing press that permitted Luther and Luther's ideas and the Reformation to happen. If, if, if he'd come along 50 years earlier, I don't think it, would, it wouldn't have happened. He wouldn't have been the guy, anyway, to make it happen because the press allowed uh, books to be printed and books in, 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 in modern languages to be printed, and, and thus everybody, every believing Protestant to be the in this priesthood of all believers, his or her own priest with his or her own Bible interpreting it at will. And, and so, uh, yeah, yes, there is this technology in then and now that are permitting these, these transformation of understanding of reality. And what you, what, you, what you had then and now have in this kind of repetition or rhyme now is, is this, this part of Protestantism that they believe so strongly and, and that, all Amer that Americans in general, beyond the, 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 the fervently religious Protestants here, I think it is part of the American character, this, this anti-establishment feeling. And I don't need to trust the experts. I can figure it out on my own. And, and this anti-elitism, which, which it was certainly given oomph and power by, by our overwhelmingly Protestant founders and forebears, but it, it, it is not just among those piously, devoutly religious Protestants today where, where that anti-establishment, anti-expert feeling is deeply rooted and, and passionately pursued. Well, one thing you point out in the book, which is fairly surprising, I don't know if other people have pointed this out before, you talk a lot about a synergy, a rather malignant synergy between religious fundamentalism and its sort of anti-rational tendencies and movements very much in academia, postmodernism in particular, which it, with its you know, doubt about science and really doubt about reality itself. And those two trends on the left and right of the political spectrum have really married in a way to bring us to this moment where it seems most people feel entitled to have their, their own take on reality itself, whether it's informed or not by even the vaguest understanding of the scientific worldview or any other real intellectual trend that could deliver them facts. So just it seems a legitimate project for most people to have a very strongly felt opinion about cosmology or global warming or, or anything else about which they may have spent no time informing themselves. And this does cut across political lines, I think, in the way that you described. You want to, you want to talk about that weird marriage? Sure. Yeah, it is a weird marriage and one that I, it had been passingly suggested here and there, but I, but I think I, I spend more time talking about it in this particular way. And, and the way in which that part of the 60s, not so much the political left in the 60s, but the cultural left and, and postmodern academia in deciding and, and absolutely insisting that reality itself is a social construct, that reason and science are not to be considered superior to magical belief or folk belief of any kind. And that became, as now we would call it, politically correct thinking in, in academia. And also, I think, it, it, as, as these things do, uh, as, as conservatives have always complained about the academy, these things seep out in, in various forms, vulgar and otherwise, into the popular understanding of reality and have had an effect. I don't know if, if, the, if the academic postmoderns are responsible for 5%, 30%, whatever, but some, there is some culpability when it, it merged with, among other things, and maybe most importantly, with the rising religious uh, fundamentalism, fundamentalism and 
and total belief in magic that the charismatic churches represent starting in the 1960s. And they were these strange bedfellows that encouraged and enabled and insisted in, in the minds of many Americans of all stripes that, yes, whatever they wish to believe, whatever they feel strongly enough, whether it's about the harmonic convergence that's about to happen because everybody is gathered on a certain day and, and, and thinking about Quetzalcoatl or, 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 or that Jesus is returning or that there is no climate change or whatever, the belief wishfully and passionately held is theirs to have by right because, of, because they are an American. And, and so, yes, the, the, it was, it was th these things that seemed at opposite ends of some spectrum in the 1960s, the kind of countercultural and academic left Bohemia on the one hand, well, on th three hands, and then, the, then the religious uh, extremism of various kinds on, on, on another hand, and then this third hand of the, of the, of, of the, the far right, the, the John Burt Society conspiracists, also coming in there and, and, and beginning this, coming together in this kind of weird stew starting, yes, in the late 1960s. So we, we've essentially jumped to the 60s in terms of our recollection of history. Is there anything you want to fill in in terms of the record, how we got to the 60s from the deep time of the religious awakening in, in the U.S.? Well, sure. I mean, that's, that's why I wrote the book. But uh, yeah, that there, I mean, we, just on, okay, on the, on the religious front, only in America did, did we have these incredibly successful new religions of unusually extravagant belief and backstory, the Mormons and, and Christian science in the 19th century, but others, the, the Millerites who believed in the, that the world was ending, which, which has all of its residual descendants around today. So that that was our religious uh, 19th century, along with the, this this um, the, this sense of I I feel the Holy Spirit within me, and and w uh, it's making me jump and dance and faint and and so forth. That too was was a very American add on, not 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 uniquely, but but a very American add on to Protestantism. And, and then interestingly, not until which I really wasn't aware of. You're you're a religious scholar long ahead of me. I, I didn't know that Pentecostalism, which is to say, believe believe that you speak in tongue, that one people can speak in tongues in a in a in a undecipherable or or maybe decipherable holy language, that that was an American invention in the 20th century. That uh, that was a surprise to me, and, and so that certainly is an important piece of the history. Speaking in tongues had happened. The founder of Shakerism had spoken in tongues, and and. And the Mormons, while they were inventing Mormonism, occasionally spoke in tongues, but it only became a central piece of a religion, Pentecostalism, and then what, what was rebranded later in the 20th century as, as charismatic Christianity in America in the 20th century. So that's, that's, that, that's the religious part. I mean, conspiracism, again, is not unique to America, but, but we began as a conspiracy to break away from England. And and we're accused, and and we were the 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 founders the the founders of the U.S. were a conspiracy certainly, but then every so often, whether it was the the mania over the the Masonic conspiracy, the Illuminati conspiracy, the Popish Papal Catholic conspiracy, that those were have been powerful moments in American history, and and they and they came and went by and large. They they had their moment, and they would last for the as long as a war lasted. When suddenly we were scared of Germans in World War One, and scared of J Japanese Americans in World War Two, scared of of Jews for a little while in the twenties, nineteen twenties. But those conspiracy moments in American history, until the last fifty years or so, came and went, and then in the sixties in no small measure because of the Kennedy assassination and, and, and beliefs about it, it's how it happened and why it happened, that was a, that was a, a tipping point where, where, where conspiracism became more of a, of, a, of a permanent and unchanging part of the, the American way of thinking about politics and society and the way the world works. So I think now we're up to date on, on these things, on and how we got to the 60s. So I, I want to talk about the current moment and you know what's wrong with it and what could well become right with it if we got our house in order. I, I, it's, I'd like to think about what the path forward toward something better could look like with respect to these various trends. But 
as the author of this book, and uh, as someone who has now spent years thinking about what's unique about the American character with respect to self-invention and self-assurance and you know, kind of believing one's own publicity and the primacy of subjectivity and even a kind of hedonism, you know, hedonism perhaps on the left and religious rectitude on the right, but this sort of real anchoring in a capacity for self-invention and uh, entrepreneurialism, which has been re remarked upon not by just ourselves, but by you know, visitors to this country as an especially American characteristic. And you add to that the birth of the internet and social media and a kind of spirit we're seeing around us now of anti-globalism, both on the right and the left. On the left, you have a, a real distrust of global capitalism. And on the right, you have a, a kind of nationalist, populist reaction to trade and immigration and both right and left are essentially wanting to stop things at the border, whether they're ideas or people or money or all three. And into this carnival emerges a character of Trumpian guile, and whether he's a brilliant con man or more of a kind of evil Chauncey Gardner, as I've come to think of him, whereas you know, it's just he's just perfectly matched to his moment, but through no great genius of his own. How do you view America, you know, take me to a November of uh, last year and come forward? What is our situation and where do you hope it, it to go at this moment? Well, as I say, ha had, uh, had those 80,000 votes in those three states gone differently and Donald Trump were not our president, we would be, in most of the ways I talk about in this book, in hot water still. We wouldn't have this <laughs> evil John C. Gardner liar in chief working so hard with with his and all his flying monkeys in the media and and his own White House to convince as many people as possible that their version of reality is correct and and reality itself is to be suspected and all that. It's making it worse, no question. So where are we? I I, I think I I think. He, for all of his ignorance and, and kind of jaw-dropping stupidity in so many ways, that Donald Trump does have a kind of, you said evil, evil genius, this kind of a knack for knowing things and feeling things that he's talked about, and, and he's, he talks about his own brilliance beyond his <laughs> Ivy League education and IQ, about knowing when things are going to change in a, or, or be valuable or, or that's going to work in, in a... In a real estate developer huckster way. And I think I've been paying close attention to him for a long time, as long as anybody. And, and I, he started talking about running for president in 1987, 88, didn't do it, flirted again every four years, again and again and again, and never did it because I think until 2012 and then finally 2016 cycles, he understood essentially what we're talking about here, what I've written about in fantasy late. You know, at some level, I, 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 I have a strong hunch that he thought he saw that the, the idea of, of, of reality and truth versus falsehood and fiction had become so blurry in, in America that he had a shot that he had never had before. So it wasn't just that he had a hit show that he didn't run in 1996 or 2000. He couldn't have gotten the nomination of a party. But I think he sensed that he could. So where are we? We are in a bad place. And, and I'm not, I have not been historically a person who has said the sky is falling and, oh, my God, America's in decline. Not at all. And, and I, I, if anything, I have been a, a kind of outlier among my general uh, ideological circles of saying, no, this is a, this is a pretty good place and it'll, it'll be fine. And, but I... I, I I don't have conviction right now that, that we can swing back to normalcy anytime soon. I, I, I do worry that the, the new, this new extraordinary disruptive technology in, in the form of the internet that allows uh, all of the various tribes and fiefdoms of, of the empirically untrue or insupportable to have their versions of reality in which people can now immerse themselves all the time makes it difficult. Doesn't it? Doesn't make me think. Oh, 
give up, all is lost. But uh, d- does it make it harder to imagine some kind of cyclical return to things the way they were when they were better? And they were, in the way that we're talking about today, better 20 years ago, even certainly 30 years ago, that there was still enough of a, of a kind of sensible establishment in control of these various institutions, the news media, the entertainment media, uh, maybe not 20 years ago, but religions as well, that, that kept them from going off the rails and, and kept every opinion and belief to be regarded as potentially equal to any other and to, fact, and to factual uh, reality itself. That's changed, and and um, you know we can all each in our private lives and and, and to the degree we have public uh, platforms do our bit to uh, fight the good fight. But I don't know how we get out of here. I, I what, what my, my, my I'm not a worse the better Leninist kind of person, but I do think on my hopeful days that perhaps the disaster of this administration will lead some people who who were inclined are inclined in this direction to have a wake up call and say two three five years hence you know that was a bad idea and 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 we should not i i was wrong to reject facts simply because they were inconvenient to me maybe that will happen maybe there will be a a, a kind of bracing and cleansing uh reaction on the part of some percentage of people that will 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 grow the what I call the reality based uh, part of us, but I am not especially hopeful right now uh, about about how we how we get out of this and and not especially believing as I used to be inclined to about the cyclical nature of history, which many historians believe and and, and talk about in terms of uh, the American polities movement from left to right and from left to right. That seems to have been the case, but this is something else. This isn't about left to right and 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 individual enterprise versus the communitarian uh, needs. This is something else that I tend to believe is more of a the toothpaste is out of the tube. How do you get it back in? Problem. Well, as you say, in invoking that phrase, reality based community, you're you're referencing Karl Rove, I believe. So that he, yes. he was. You know, he was one of the early engineers of this kind of political cynicism, and that has given us the full uh, horror of someone like Kellyanne Conway, who can, you know, with seemingly with without a a single neuron in her head, <laughs> feeling guilty, can just espouse falsehood after falsehood and spin every conceivable inconvenient fact to some other purpose. But it does seem like something has shifted now, where there seems to be, when you think of whatever it is, the 35 percent, the 38 percent of people who support Trump, it's very hard to see what would convince them that he's not a fit president, right? I mean, like, you, you'd have to imagine the, the, you know, the stock market going to zero or a nuclear war with North Korea that, that seemed unjustified, or, you know, or it seemed like a, a wag the dog nuclear war before you would pick off a significant percentage of those people and get them to admit, ah, this, is, this was the path we didn't actually want to go down. And short of that, I, mean, I don't know what it means to have a, a society where there is literally nothing that can be said. There's no set of facts that can be adduced that are, are so undignified and uncontroversial so as to, to fundamentally change a person's perception of the leader of the personality cult that they have joined. And that it, it does have the character of a kind of personality cult where a support for, for him is divorced from any honest conversation about what he's like, what he says, what it means, what he would attempt to do if given all the power that he wants. And it doesn't seem like a normal political conversation we're having. I entirely agree with you. Uh, and And I mean, one again when I when I try to imagine hopeful ways this ends, you know, great personality cults have ended abruptly for various reasons in the past, and I can imagine this one doing so. As you say, any of those catastrophes happen. If I I had imagined just in a kind of political sense that that if indeed Trump Care 
had been the new uh, healthcare system, or, and it still may be, that that would be a place where the rubber finally met the road and, and his supporters would say, hey, what? This isn't what I counted on. And, and, and they would lose their faith in the great and powerful wizard. But, you know, until, until pretty late in the game, and to the degree, again, we're just talking about Trump's political standing, until pretty late in the game, I mean, Nixon still had great support in 1974, and then it collapsed. There, there was a collapsing moment. We can imagine that, I guess. However, as you say, and, and as I write about in this book, we didn't then have what we have now, which is this powerful telecommunications complex in the form of Fox News and, and, and talk radio and the internet in all of its various forms to maintain the, the aggrieved in their version of reality. So uh, we've not been here before. So even if and when that political collapse happens and the 38 or 33% goes down to 25% or whatever, some large number of that 25% will still believe, will believe, no, he was right. They purged him. And, and that's that, what, one of the great questions, and I have again and again, thinking about the people in this book and the stories in this book, did Joseph Smith really believe that he had the missing piece of the Bible? I, I'm not sure he didn't sincerely believe that. Does Donald Trump really believe many of the things he says, the preposterous conspiracy theories that he puts out and so forth? I think he believes some of it. So that's, that's the, the chilling part of this for me, is, is this, okay, we know what a lie is. And, I, and it, for instance, Kellyanne Conway, I think she's simply a liar of an extreme, cynical, profligate kind. And, and we know what madness is. And I think there's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a great mixture of, I kind of believe, I sort of believe, I'm not sure I believe, I, I want to believe. I, all, I know I hate these liberals on television. So that's, that's where we are. And, and in, in a way that I'm not sure we have been before, where, where, after these traumatic moments where a conspiracist upsurge ends or, or Nixon is thrown out or whatever, there's a kind of chastened, oh, yeah, that was a bad idea. After the Salem witch trials uh, in, 60, in 1692. I will see. I, I, think, I think because of, of, of where we've gotten to over the last 50 years especially, especially and where we are with our communication system, I'm going to cross all of my fingers to hope that this won't end as badly as I can imagine it ending. Well, there is something about social media that seems to be potentiating much that is wrong with us in, in, in the way we have these conversations. And, and, and it does come down to some of those gradations of dishonesty you, you just pointed out and, and are not really seeing bright lines between them. Because yes, there, there are liars who just lie with with the the clear conscience of a psychopath, and and I, I actually think Trump is among them. I think he I mean, he lies more than anyone who I could name. Yes, and yes. I think he knows he yes. lies, and he's so he's not delusional. He's he's actually lying. Then he's probably just confused about or ignorant of the, yes. the true extent of his ignorance. So he thinks <laughs> yes. he's got an opinion about something, and he thinks it's probably. You know, he's just spitballing. He knows as much as anyone in the room about X, and he's unaware of how much there is to know about X and how little he, he in fact, knows, and, his, and that his words are in demonstrable contrast with reality it doesn't really trouble him, but he's not actually conscious of lying. And many people are in that space a lot where they're just talking, and they, they're not aware of, of what they don't know. But there's this, yeah, I guess cynicism is the is the name for it, or it's, it's the only word I, I know by which to name it. There's, there's this attitude when criticizing those one disagrees with, where people have ceased to care about the norms of adult conversation and civility and, and intellectual honesty. So that like, if you can slime someone successfully with something which is in fact not true like you, you don't even have to care whether it's true right. you, you, this is this is a valid way of winning it's just these are what we have are dueling pr campaigns and it's not about really interacting with an, another person's argument or thesis or or record it's about just shaming them into silence somehow and everything 
that's happening on the left and the right now with respect to politics and with respect to any of these moments in the news that, that have a real political and moral charge, I mean, like, you know, like the, the Harvey Weinstein scandal, right? There's, there's, there's what's happening, and however bad it is, but then there's a kind of attitude of moral panic that grows up on either side of the thing. And in that panic, and many people claim that you know my reaction to Trump is part of a kind of moral panic, that he's not nearly as bad as I've made him out to be. I mean, again, this is it's very hard to get one's bearings here because the very criticism one has of the situation can be used against you. But we are, it seems, and I think largely as a result of of social media and the sense that it, it's, it's just good to retweet articles that one hasn't even read just because one likes their titles, there's this amplification of outrage and kind of thoughtless criticism of, of the opposite side, which is just it's stirring this up into some kind of tempest. And it, it's very hard to get back to civil discourse about important topics. I, I think that's right. And I think part of the the one of the of the tributaries of that causing that is is what I talk about a lot in the book about how in its individual parts the the kind of entertainment world and the what I call the fantasy industrial complex as I call it, which blurs the distinctions between the real and the fictional and makes people think, oh, I own a, an NFL team. No, you don't. You're playing fantasy football. But no, no, I own an NFL team. All of those ways, again, individually benign, mostly, I think have encouraged that. And I think have encouraged it because, of course, social media takes place on the internet, as does so many of these other living in fiction things that, that we have had enabled in the last 15 to 20 years. So I, I think in a certain way, the I'm going to say these horrible things about my opponents over here is converting real life and these real people whom you don't know and don't see, and they're, it's just through the screen, into characters in a game or, or, or players on a, in, a, in a sport. And, and, and losing the, the distinctions the, uh, uh, between, between fiction and reality. And, and why be civil towards somebody who just exists as a character on a screen, which, which to people who no doubt hate us, uh, we are. And, 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 and again, it's not just people who hate us who are suffer from that. It's, it, as you suggest, it happens across various ideological spectra. Although, let, let's not fall into, let's stipulate that it, it is worse right now on the right than it is on the left. And, and, and you mentioned Harvey Weinstein and that the issue of sexual predation and sexual harassment. I saw a, a YouGov survey in the last few days, which struck me, which is that essentially equivalent large majorities of Republicans and Democrats, two thirds, more than two thirds, believed that the allegations against Harvey Weinstein were credible and probably true. When they asked about the, the sexual uh, allegations by 20 women against Donald Trump, something like a tiny minority of Republicans believed that they were credible, which, which leads me to believe, and maybe it's unique to sexual harassment, I don't think so, but I thought that was a good illustration of the way in which, at least in that one limited sphere, we, we saw that the left, the political left, was willing to say, yeah, this, this big liberal uh, benefactor and donor to a guy who agrees with us about politics is a bad guy, and I'm willing to accept that fact, even though it's unfortunate for my politics. Do you know? I, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good small illustration of the, of the asymmetry of, of the create-your-own-reality phenomenon that is afoot in this country now. As you go far enough left, I'm starting to think that the penchant for unreality is is more or less equivalent sure. to the extreme on the right. Sure. But I agree with you that I mean that the left picks different battles to fight and it is there's there is an asymmetry here in the that the left cannibalizes itself in a way that the right doesn't. People on the right or in the Republican establishment, we can see how they have circled the wagons with this very unestablishment person at their center, and now we're all waiting to see, you know, what misstep so 
egregious would be sufficient to get someone like Paul Ryan to to come forward and say, well, you, you know, listen, I, we have, we, it's been coming for some time. You know, I, I have to admit now that I, I can't stand by this president. Like, what would it take? Right. But on the left, it wouldn't take all that much because the left's penchant for self-criticism and self-doubt becomes a kind of self-immolation again and again, where you like you, you can see people on the left who are multiracial and transgender, but they're still not sufficiently progressive so as to inoculate them against being savaged by their more progressive colleagues. Everything reads like an Onion article when you get into this space. Literally, you have you know professors at, at Rutgers and Brandeis who are getting howled out of their classrooms yes. for using the wrong term. And, you know, the, the, these are the same people who have been on Twitter howling at everybody else about their use of terms. So it's just, you know, the, the left eats its own in the way that the right doesn't. Well, th- that's true. And, and for now, anyway, the, 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 the size and power of that part of the left is, is much, much smaller than, than, than that part of the right. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's true. The other thing, the, a thought experiment that I've done, I work on regularly and have for the last year is who would be and could there be a Trump of the left that people on the left would, against their better judgment, and, and say, well, like, she's amazing and she's, she's, a, she's a kook and she's terrible in this way and she's awful, but by God, she, she believes in socialized medicine and this and that. I'm going with it. Like, to what degree and under what circumstances could that happen? It's hard to imagine the equivalent, but, but I'm, I, I'm willing to accept that we might have to make those choices as, as people of the left uh, eventually. You're saying you're willing to imagine that we might have to promote some no. equivalent colossus? <laughs> well, no, that we might have to. Well, as you know, in this book, I, I spend a lot of time in pages holding Oprah Winfrey accountable for much of the pseudoscience and, and, and yeah. magical thinking that is afoot in America. People talk very seriously about Oprah Winfrey being a potential Democratic nominee for president. And, and she, she sort of stepped into my thought experiment a few months ago, like, OK, she's the nominee. Do I, is, is, that, is that my Trump moment where what, what, what honest Republicans had to do with Donald Trump and, and those who decided, no, I can't abide this and became never Trumpers, would I be a never, never Oprah person? Uh, and that, that, that will be a character test for me. Who should run as a Democrat in 2020? Do you have anyone on your list who you think this is, this is a perfect choice? Not a perfect choice. And, and, I, and again, in, in this like anything's possible a moment, I, I don't know. I, I can't say with any conviction. I did. Uh, I had a moment listening to a long interview, uh, I guess, that Ezra Klein did on his podcast with Al Franken. And and I'd never and I I've known Al Franken slightly for years uh, and I'd never I hadn't thought of him as like oh yes president someday, but I suddenly thought in a post Trump world and in and perhaps in an anti Trump election he could make sense as a, as a Democratic candidate because he's certainly smart eminently reasonable he's all, he's all the right things but he also has this impolitic candor an ability to perform, an ability to be funny in a way that Donald Trump has in his, in his realm. I suddenly thought like, whoa, he, <laughs> no disrespect, Senator Franken, but he's kind of the Democratic Donald Trump. So maybe him, but again, you know, there, you know, there are all kinds of vaguely attractive people that, uh, and, and I mean attractive in the, <laughs> not the physical sense, who, 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 who I think I'd be fine with, but I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't say, no, Martin O'Malley must run again. I don't have those kinds of uh, uh, firm beliefs. What is the role of fame and the industry that produces it here for us, I mean, just historically and now going forward? Because we, part of what you have just described is the way in which reality is becoming indistinguishable from a reality television show, which is because we're, we're, we are sort of entertaining ourselves into the abyss because of the way we're using this technology, the way, the way that technology is capturing our attention. So if you're, you're, you're watching videos on Facebook, you're, you're having articles forwarded to you by those you have chosen to follow on Twitter, you're watching television, and you're often watching the part of television that purports to be 
reality, but it's this sort of confection of some kind. It's a kind of game show, but but it's not it's not that it's not reality either, because these people are actually in unscripted situations. Uh, and you know, Trump, it came out of whatever it was, fourteen years of of engineering that situation for himself. How is our relationship to fame culpable here, or or now indispensable for? for what is happening. It's definitely part of, of, of what got us here. And I will point out that in addition to being a reality television star, a guy who played a boss on television for 15 years, which was cr- Donald Trump would not now be president had that not happened. He was also, of course, uh, a figure in professional wrestling and a member of the WWE Hall of Fame, which is m- more than simply a perfect metaphor for where we are now. But I write a long history, and, 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 and a, a, par, a big part of America's long history has a pop culture and advertising at its center, and, and, and Americans as the inventors of the modern pop culture industry in so many ways. And then, beginning in the 20th century, after we invented Hollywood, and, and, and that larger than by orders of magnitude celebrity industry, this, this, this fame pursued for its own sake, the attention of the masses for its own sake as the only way we can really be, have agency and feel powerful and potent because the rest of us schlubs and nobodies don't really have any power. Fame is it. Fame is celebrities have agency. The rest of us don't. Not unique to America, but, but in, its, in its extremity and I think defining of America. So Donald Trump, again, before he was a uh, reality show star i back in the 80s and 90s i i was always struck by by one thing more than anything else about him not that he was a bully and a liar and vulgar and all these other things that he was because i'd known other people who had been all those things but i'd never i could not name then and i certainly cannot name now anybody i've seen who is more voracious in 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 his or her need for attention which is to say some kind of celebrity notoriety infamy fame and it was true then and 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 now he has it and so and that is not a separate thing from from the entertainment showbiz thing that the presidency was becoming before Donald Trump and that he has made it entirely which is to say he understands he doesn't he not only wants our attention and he's got our attention he's got America's attention every day and every hour he also understands he needs to entertain and so whether it's it's tweeting some outrageous thing to make everybody talk about him again or whatever it is he he is that he is that guy on stage in vaudeville or now in in the oval office who understands that Wait, wait, I'm losing you. Let me do this nutty thing. And so that's, that's, that is how he has turned this in the presidency, his presidency, into a form of entertainment that it had never been, that it got in the TV age through Kennedy and, and Reagan and Clinton. It, it, it edged, Lord knows, closer to, to that, but uh, he's taken it all the way in a way that, that fits into his, this particular pathology for, for wanting everyone to look at him. He also wants respect, which he's, which he's never gotten in, and, and beyond his 30 or 40% is never going to get, which is a separate issue. But, but, but it's just the attention that a, a Tumblr on stage needs, a uh, Thrive Zone, like you and I need air and water. Yeah, so what do you think these social media companies should do to protect our conversation with ourselves better than they have thus far. I mean, I, you know, obviously we've, we've got the the Russian hacking component to this, which is its own problem. But do you have any sense of what Twitter and Facebook, in particular, should have done and should now be doing going forward? I, I literally don't know enough about the technology to be able to say what they should have done. It seems clear to me, though, that they have the ability and that, and the obligation now to see what they can do in terms of their processes and their technology and all the rest to mitigate the worst things that they have been that they have enabled uh, y- they have some obligation of course that the their the argument went long before this election of internet providers 
back in the old days and, and, and more recently, Facebook and Twitter. Oh, no, we're just we're like the telephone company. We just provide the wires that we, we don't we're not a media company. Well, clearly, uh, I mean, that was always disingenuous. And, and now it's become something worse than that. They are the most powerful media companies. Uh, <laughs> well, Facebook certainly is in the world. And, and therefore, they have an obligation absent the quaint little, you know, fairness doctrine that we used to have to governing uh, American radio and television broadcasts to come up with ways, as I say, to not to make it perfect, that's never possible, but to mitigate the dangerous degradation of, of Republican ideals, that's a small r, Republican ideals, and democracy that, they, that they're enabling. What do you think about what it'll take to defend the Enlightenment going forward? One way to see your thesis here is that the Enlightenment has come under sustained assault. I mean, the, the value of having one's beliefs and opinions be in some sort of register with reality as it is, and, and the value of caring about the departures from reality that are consequential, that seems to be the under assault again on, on the left and the right. And the tools by which we can get the better part of our society to notice the problem and and agree about how to correct it, it seem, seem to be in short supply when you have essentially the equivalent of some kind of satanic panic on campuses around any authority being indistinguishable from from oppression, you know, whether it's class oppression or racial oppression or, you know, capitalist conflicts of interest. The, the very word uh, truth has a, a serious branding problem at the moment. It does, indeed. And, and it's when we talk about what happened in the 60s, that was when the Enlightenment and, and all that we mean by that came under explicit attack, both by the, the religious fundamentalists and by uh, people on the, on the cultural left and political left, especially on campuses. So, so yes, that, that has been a, a kind of strange bedfellows, um, unwitting tag team going on now for a half a century. It's troublesome. I, I think, I think I, again, I, having grown up in a household of sane Republicans and conservatives, that is my parents, I know what that looks like. And, and I don't, and I, and, and my hope lies in the belief that it's not entirely gone. And for instance, I can, I, I, once uh, it can be and demonstrated and shown that economic prosperity and the, and, the, and the amazing economic prosperity that America has, has enjoyed for so long is truly jeopardized uh, if we lose the Enlightenment. That there, beyond the, oh, it, it's a, it would be, a, it would be a, tr a loss of tragic proportions because that's our civilization. Yeah, sure, fine. But I think there is also an argument that it would be dumb, that it would, that it would be self-destructive to sort of make ourselves a second-rate or third-rate economy and, 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 and economic machine as the, the atheistic Chinese ascend. I, I think that argument, perhaps, can help, can be a front in the, in the struggle to save, uh, save the Enlightenment. I agree there that the, insofar as you can put a price tag on bad ideas or the, the, co the material cost of not having good ideas, that seems to get through to people in ways that are not so sensitive to political party. It'll be interesting to see what would happen if we had a, a, a real change of fortune economically and how that would get talked about on, on both sides. And, and of course, what you say, the, the, the egregious extremes that you point out that happen so often on campuses certainly exist in, in a perfect, horrible symbiosis with the, the powerful forces on the right in places like Wisconsin and elsewhere that want to def keep defunding public universities because of their, those damn liberals. Well, those two factions serve each other quite well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's the, the other thing that is worrisome here. You, you see how the pendulum swing on the left into identity politics and, and leftist forms of, of tribalism and unreason will, in every case, simply give more strength to their opposing forces on the right. Sufficient commitment to identity politics on the left can only bring us 
white identity politics right. on the right. right. And, and and people say about all, so many things, often jokingly, oh, yeah, that's why Trump won. But those things are part of why Trump won. Listen, Kurt, it's been fascinating, and I, I really can't recommend your book highly enough. We've only touched on part of it here. Uh, again, the book is Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire. And is there is there anything that we have completely neglected to touch that you want to, to bring into the picture here before I let you I, I feel like you've done an exceptionally uh, a complete job of, of, of either touching on or letting me touch on all of the, all of the major threads. So I appreciate it. And, and I really enjoy talking to you. Nice. Well, tell people before you go the best points of contact online to find you. I, I know you must be on, I know you're on Twitter because I just followed you. What uh, websites do you want them to have in their heads? Twitter is, is where I spend most of my social media time and energy. Uh, I also have a, a website, which is KurtAnderson.com. That's K-U-R-T and Anderson, S-E-N. And uh, there I am as well. Well, thanks, Kurt. I hope we do this in person at some I point. I would love it. Thank you so much, Sam. If you're enjoying the Waking Up podcast, there are many ways you can support it. 